Okay, Rob Gamel here. Welcome again to the Small Business Acceleration Program and Workshop. Today, we're really getting to work. We started easy last week. With, uh, we got into a lot of background info, particularly about Apple. Uh, we, uh, so this week, we'll be focusing more on creating a common starting point for everybody in taking their business to the next level. Now it gets a lot more interesting and relevant for your particular business. So let's get our heads in the right place today. Our goal, to dramatic, dramatically improve products or services. Of course, this is what Apple's was, and this is what we want ours to be too. We want them to be so popular that they become loved. So customers and clients will part with their money and feel good about it when they're doing so. So to get there, you're here to think differently and how to do this faster. So let's quickly review where we are in the course. In weeks one and two, we wanted to focus in on what you do best, who values it, how it can be more focused. The next two weeks are about how to add a game changer to your business. And in weeks five to six, it's all about hands-on creation of marketing materials to launch your new thing, whether it's a product or a service or some other um, hybrid combination of the two. So we've already completed what you do best. Most of you turned in um, your worksheets. Um, a bunch of you completed pyramids. Some of them wanted to revisit that. I've given feedback to everybody who sent stuff in, and I was very impressed by a lot of the thinking that I saw. For those of you who haven't had the opportunity to complete that yet, I highly recommend you do so because we'll be using that to leverage the next step that we'll be discussing today. Okay, so today we'll be providing more uh, background on how Apple thinks. This will loosen your minds up a little bit more, but we'll also be talking about deeper aspects of it and getting into some of the emotional content. More specifically, we'll be talking about the value of differentiation to uh, a little bit deeper than we did last week. Uh, we'll be talking about the um, findings from completing the value pyramid for those folks who have. We'll be doing a deeper dive in thinking empathetically with our customers and clients. And then we'll be connecting the dots between them, what they need and what they want, and what we're good at and what we want to be able to do so that we're synchronized with them. And then we'll talk a little bit about generating some game-changing ideas based on that work that you're doing in the assignments. That will lead us to pyramid exercise number two, which is a modification of what you completed last for last week, and the development of the message platform. This will be the first iteration. Um, it doesn't need to be perfect. We'll be revisiting it, but uh, that'll be the assignment for today. And then I always like to finish with a little bit of inspiration for you. So last week, we talked about the quiet revolution. And as you recall, a few hundred years ago, the bulk of commerce was focused on extracting commodities. And then it evolved to making goods. Uh, that further evolved to the delivery of goods, you know, like brewed coffee, to present day where an awful lot of the sophisticated businesses, whether they're very large ones or they're small businesses like you and me, are integrating experiences, relationships, that type of thing into what they're doing. And some of them, where it's appropriate, are taking that to a another level where they're providing guidance uh, that results in transformations, okay? So at the upper level, at the upper levels, both for differentiation and profitability, there are huge opportunities for people to differentiate their businesses and build in uh, really wonderful and powerful competitive advantages that will not just drive loyalty amongst their clients and customers, but also 
deliver great profits if they can execute it uh, correctly and we've got our heads uh, correctly aligned. So if you take a sample business like coffee, you know, you started with extracting that coffee um, and you evolved to making it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, one thing that isn't always appreciated is that in that, bus in that business model, you started out doing one or two or maybe three things you had to get right and you had a happy customer. But if we flash forward today, a company like Starbucks with their chain, they have to do a hundred things right. Actually more accurately, they have to do thousands of things right every day. And even when they do that right, if they don't let somebody use the restroom who wasn't a customer, they have to go back to square one and revisit their brand values, do some additional training, that type of thing. So this notion of understanding the foundation of a business and where the value is along this chain is really critical, particularly if you wanna grow your business, expand it, take it to the next level and get more sophisticated. I'll tell you a short story. You're, we're all familiar with, app, with Google and Yahoo, but few people know that Yahoo by all rights should have beat the hell out of Google. They had a much bigger user base, they were more profitable, Google couldn't figure out how to make money from their business. They had two advantages over uh, Yahoo, but that was it. Yahoo was beating them in every other category. Google had fewer uh, risk listed responses when you did a search, but they ranked them. The second thing they did better than Yahoo was they did it faster. They delivered those results almost instantly. The third thing that few people know about was that they took those two factors and they were able to grow their business faster. And because of that, they were able to attract more people and attract more money to provide funding that gave them an unfair competitive advantage. They still, of course, hadn't figured out how to make money. Yahoo did that first by acquiring a company that set up auctions for their ads. Google smartly decided to imitate that, but improve it and take it to the next level by making everybody participate in the auctions, not just making it optional. So the rest of it is history. You know, uh, Yahoo um, in the not too distant future will become a side note and Google will continue to grow and expand. So um, I wanted to give that on a macro level, a little example of uh, the importance of understanding where the value is and how that helps you with differentiation. So last week we talked about the value pyramid, how important it was to start at the bottom, go through functional attributes, move up to rational benefits that are delivered, um, understand the emotional benefits, go into the personality, how it's delivered, and then boil all that down into an essence. So a bunch of you did that and did a great job of it last week. So now let's revisit some of what's going on in the ebook that a bunch of you have seen. So the first thing we wanna keep in mind that when it comes to thinking about the customer experience, the best place to start is at the end with what you do, what you deliver, and what they're feeling. It's all about staging that experience so that it's one that customers want to repeat. And if, you, if it's really awesome, they'll tell other people about it too. So we want to make it remarkable. We want to get feedback from them on that. And then we also want to show some gratitude to them, finish with some appreciation. Apple's always made a big effort of this and a lot of other very successful businesses do too at all scales, you know, big ones as well as small town businesses. So the second thing that we wanna do is, um, well, we talked about getting feedback, but we also wanna pay attention to who's craving it and who's most likely to act based on that. And then lastly, so that we're really zeroing in we want to deliver all of it with empathy. We want to pay attention to what's your unique cure. 
what's, re what's the remarkable solution that you can deliver today, tomorrow, day in, day out, okay? There's one other thing that I wanna just emphasize a little bit. You know, um, one thing that Steve Jobs was a master at was putting on a different hat, putting himself in somebody else's shoes. Yes, he was a very powerful, demanding, intimidating guy, but he was never regal like that. He was always an everyday guy. You know, he would show up in his jeans and his Birkenstocks or whatever and his black uh, crew neck shirt. He didn't want to wear a suit and uh, pretend to be anybody other than he was. And it, it helped him stay in touch with typical customers. It also helped him keep in mind that he wanted to be in tuned with the pain that his customers and users were feeling. So to do that, you wanna empathize with the audience and tap into those basic human needs. So let me just give you an example here. When I uh, was at Apple, I was originally an industrial designer. And I, of course we used to do sketches and that type of thing, but the real work began when we started working three dimensionally. And I used to like to start from the outside and consider all of the important factors that were in the minds of the users, the purchaser of the product, the user of the computer, whatever it might be, the interactions they were gonna have with it, both uh, the functional things as well as the emotional and uh, the combination of things. So I would start with the outside and I would start playing around with ideas for what I thought would solve the issue or address the host of um, issues and pain points that we wanted to uh, solve. Only after I felt like I'd done a good job of that would I um, do the engineering part and I would collect all the components that needed to be put together. I start playing around with how they fit together. And then I would make a clear enclosure for it to see how the stuff might fit together. And I would work with the rest of the engineering team on that and we would address things like heat dissipation, et cetera, et cetera. Then we would go back and revisit it from the outside again. So we would do this iterative thing. We would start from the outside and then re-envision re it from the inside out. And then again, from the outside in, each time making improvements trying to shrink it, optimize it, and address any issues or bugs that we'd encountered in the process. Well, I like to do the same thing when I think about marketing. So what we're gonna do this week is we're gonna flip the pyramid a bit. This time, we're gonna do another exercise very similar to what we did last week, but we're gonna start at the top. And we're going to put ourselves in the shoes of our customers and clients and our target audiences. We want to keep top of mind the most frequent complaints that we hear from them. Not just the specific ones, but also the comprehensive ones. If you read between the lines, you know, what are they really saying when we hear complaints or we hear feedback that isn't about how awesome we, you know, we are or what we did was. Um, I want you to ignore why they're offering up those complaints for now. I just want you to picture the situations. Open your eyes, open your ears, look, look around, take it all in. And then write down the impressions that you have. Write down everything you can think of, um, even stupid things, just write it down and then go back and identify which ones are the worst ones. Then identify which ones you can improve. Now, imagine breaking convention, not the law, just convention, okay? Um, and coming up with some conventional, or I'm sorry, coming up with some solutions that might not be conventional, you know? Do a little brainstorming. Then, from those, pick some of the most remarkable ones that you can do and you can do well. Now, I'd like you to complete the pyramid. This time, however, we want to answer this question about essence. If only Blake 
didn't suck so much. So fill in the blank with that, and then we'll work our way down the period. So next, we want to focus in on personality. And imagine that your business, what you do, is a person, right? And picture answering this. The solver's behavior is blah, blah, blah. You know, friendly, helpful, generous, knowledgeable, so on, motivational, whatever it might be. And then we want to move down the next level and address emotional benefits. The solution being delivered makes me feel, whether it's a product, a combination of things, and so on. Answer that. And then we'll address the rational benefits. Because it cures or solves blank and list whatever those items might be. And then we'll finish where we started last week with the functional components. So what you're filling in here is the delivery. Now, if you, as you're doing this assignment, you can revisit what you did last week, or you can decide that you're gonna put that to the side and you're gonna do this off the top of your head you know, of course, you're going to have some memory of what you did last week, and that's going to help. But I kind of like the idea of taking a fresh perspective now based on our discussion today and starting without looking at what you did last week, just to see what you come up with. I think you might be surprised at some of the new stuff. Okay, now we're wearing our marketing caps, right? Um, but I want to get into something that will be helpful in completing this exercise. So unfortunately, marketing has a complicated reputation. Um, too much of it is basically spin, especially if there's politics involved. Here we are on voting day, right? So um, I just want to tell you that we want to think much more expansively. Marketing is about so much more than putting lipstick on pigs or whatever your favorite animal is. The way I view it, the best marketing is thinking comprehensively about everything your business does, not just the products and services it delivers or that moment where it's being delivered and with the customer and the relationship there, but everything that led up to that too. So the best marketing by companies like Whole Foods, Apple, Pete's Coffee, Body Works, et cetera, is about both delivering a product and a service, as well as it is educating the consumer and helping them improve their lives and helping them understand why their products and services are gonna help them improve their lives and do the right things for not just themselves, but their families, communities, the planet, et cetera. So it's all connected, okay? Now I come from Silicon Valley, although I've spent half my life um, in, the, in rural settings in the country and half of it in urban and high-tech environments. So in Silicon Valley, there's this great expression, fake it till you make it, especially amongst the startup community. Well, I wanna revisit that attitude and that philosophy. Last week, I mentioned the importance of honesty, especially with yourself. Just for now, for this assignment, I'd like you to be extremely brutal, brutally honest with yourself. The best results will come from embracing the deepest truths. No worries, though. I'm not asking you to admit the, them to your audiences, your clients, customers, even to family members. Just between you and the assignment that you're doing, okay, while you're doing the work. Because after all, what we would rather do than fake it is, is face it, right? If we wanna get to the really valuable insights and uh, uncover what we can deliver uniquely. Okay, now just to put this in perspective and give you another way of thinking, I'm all about teaching you some different thinking. Right. So um, there's one person who's a very provocative thinker, 
and um, and he gave some career advice a few uh, a few years ago, and he was giving a talk, and he said during this talk, in my life, uh, in life, if you want something extraordinary, you basically have two paths. One, you become you can become the best at one specific thing. But by the way, that's a lot of work and the vast majority of us will never achieve that no matter how hard we try. The second approach is to become very good, you know, in the top 25% at two or more things. So imagine this. Um, this was quoted by Scott Adams, the creator of Dilbert, the cartoon that you just saw. So he realized drawing some Venn diagrams <clears throat> because he worked with a lot of engineers and he was familiar with them, that uh, he was better than 75% of the population at art. He also realized from the engineers and other folks he worked with that he had a pretty good sense of humor. It was extremely dry, but a lot of people enjoyed it. And lastly, because all of his first jobs with very large organizations, he really had a good understanding of the dysfunction and the politics and the corruption in all of them. And he loved um, the irony in an awful lot of that. So you take these three things together and what do you end up? A cartoonist. So when he decided to make a change in his career and change it, and take it in a completely different direction and maybe with a little work and hard uh, and luck, take it to a much higher level. He settled on becoming a cartoonist, focusing on the business environment that so many people will uh, spend an awful lot of their lives in. So I thought this might be a, a helpful uh, aside and tip and another way to think. So let's revisit our topic for today. What do um, customers and clients really need and want that we can deliver? So we've been through the pyramid exercises. We've done a whole bunch of work here. You know, on the screen, you can see some of the pages that I've filled out as I've gone through a couple iterations and done some work with some other clients here. So, um, and I, I, I did more work than I had to because I wanted to make sure I wasn't missing any, any really unique opportunities. So that's what we're trying to do today. So we're trying to think differently in flipping the pyramid. This time, um, you're, we're starting at the top. And I wanna show you where I netted out. Um, I updated all of my thinking about ad water within the last week as I was preparing for this webinar. So I started at the top. I wrote down wings for SMB marketing as the problem I wanted to solve. It was articulated as, if only SMB marketing didn't suck so much. So I want to put wings on that, right? The next thing I did was I put together the best um, items that I had on each of my worksheets, and you can see them here. But then I went through and I asked myself, from a customer's perspective, which ones most effectively meet their needs and wants? So on the personality level, being practical. Sure, they want to be motivated and sure they'd like me to be sharing everything that I can in terms of insights and knowledge and experience. But when all said and done, they want to make sure that they can actually execute. So I've circled practical as the first item here on the personality and taking that approach. In terms of the emotional benefits, well, I think being competitive is pretty important. Um, all of us are in categories where we have a lot of competition. And we might not like to admit it, but the audience of people that we would be talking to to get leads, to develop new client, patient, customer relationships, they have an enormous um, array of options that they can choose rather than picking us. So being competitive is critical there. Um, on the rational benefits, of course, it's important to have a strategy and a plan 
It's important to have a competitive advantage. It's important to get some coaching and mentoring so that we can be best at, work, at what we're doing and stay on track with our plan. But for an awful lot of it, and this has certainly been true uh, for me many times in my career, just getting unstuck from where we are, whether we're in a rut or we're on a plateau, and moving to a new place that's where we can be much more effective and successful is really what it's been about. And then on the most functional level, what were the one or two things that I felt were most relevant? Well, number one, developing and understanding a methodology that would take all the uncertainty and all the hassle out of trying to figure this out by yourselves. So this is a combination, the way I described it here, of methodology and training. The second thing is different thinking. I mean, we can all go watch a video, we can buy a book, we can talk to other people who've been successful in business, but that doesn't mean we're gonna be able to connect the dots on that and put together a plan that actually gets executed. So we need to think differently and have some model for putting it to work. All right, so that was reviewing it from the customer's needs and wants perspective. Then I went through it and I looked at things from my perspective. What do I think is really valuable for me to deliver to them? So in the personality level, I think it's really critical to give you some motivation so you will actually take action. I could have the world's best advice and savviest methodology and techniques and information that I'm sharing with you, but if you're not motivated to take action and put it to work, the rest of it was a waste. Secondly, to make sure that you're prepared. On an emotional level, the more confident you feel about um, where you are and prepared to put, to put into action and put out there in front of the public um, your new product, your offering, or just the improved version of whatever you're doing right now um, is about being prepared. So to drive that and to help you be competitive, you want to have a strategy and a plan for doing that. One of my partners that I worked with in a startup um, was infamous amongst our group of uh, 35 people at one point for always saying, plan the work, then work the plan. Plan the work, work the plan. Honest to God, we could have killed them a few times. Well, he mentioned that so frequently, but he's right. If you wanna get something accomplished, make a plan and then fall, stick to your plan. And then lastly, on the most functional level, I've spent half of my career being a consultant and mentoring clients, over 150 of them now, but also internally in startups or large organizations I've worked in, I've played the role of mentor uh, when I've been in a management position too. So this is, I know from past experience and feedback, this is very valuable too. So this works in combination with all of the other uh, deliverables that you see here in the pyramid. And then you notice that there's some overlap in some of these. So that's just a nice coincidence. So I rebuilt the pyramid and um, I'd like all of you to do this too. And so here's how it works out. You know, from a, a customer perspective, from their sh where they sit and stand, I wanna focus on the mo being motivational, prepared, developing strategy and plan, providing consulting and, memoring, uh, and mentoring. And then from the other perspective, doing it in a way that's pragmatic, making sure that um, from a uh, benefits perspective, people are feeling competitive, that rationally they're feeling unstuck from where they were, and then on a functional level, they're thinking differently than they were before, their head is in a new space, they've got a new mindset, and that the methodology and the training is being used on a regular basis through the execution. Now we're not ignoring the other things that we've listed here, 
Those are also very important. But remember, like Starbucks, those fall into the category of the other tens or hundreds or thousands of things that we also need to do in executing our business and keeping our clients, um, customers, and patients happy. Okay, so we don't want to ignore them. It's just that those are lower priority. So here's what we do with once we've completed the pyramid. We put together a message platform. Now, each of you will be doing this yourselves, but feel free to do this a couple of times and then send me your best version for feedback. So last week, I quickly went through one that had been done recently for a dental practice. So you see here that their vision, their long-term goal, is to deliver whole body wellness. Now, this isn't something they want to talk about necessarily to all of their patients, but this is something that they talk about when they're recruiting the team that they're putting together because they want to make sure that there's alignment so everybody's rowing the boat in the same direction. And so from a marketing perspective, they have the same attitude, they will be communicating the same ideas, et cetera, et cetera. The promise, now this addresses their patient's perspective is personal and complete dental health. So this is what this dental practice delivers day in, day out, and can do at a very high quality level. And on their best days, they deliver it at a remarkable level. The hook, this is where the marketing plays a role and we might give it a little bit of spin to make it memorable and to uh, insert maybe an emotional hook so that people, so that it feels better. We might express it as dental care the way you want it. That's how they want it expressed after the end of our brainstorming. But that always needs to be supported, right? By some proof points and uh, some claims that make it more personally relevant. So the first one in this instance was patient tailored dental treatment that was built upon tangible deliverables, like personalized treatment plans, database with rich patient preferences and history, staff comprehensively trained in practices. The second, complete dental wellness, one-stop shopping for family cosmetic and other uh, dental services. State-of-the-art um, care treatment rooms, that type of thing, and the latest technologies. They invested an awful lot of those. But the biggest investment they made was in hiring and staffing with the best qualified dentists, um, hygienists, and other staff members. And then not being satisfied that they were the best they could find, but they over-invested in continuous and never-ending never improvement through training and education. Okay, so let's think differently about this for a moment. So let's imagine um, an Apple store, but Let's imagine that there's only one Apple store and it's not owned by Apple, it's owned by somebody who lives in the same town that we live and work in. They just happened to sell Apple products and they had this idea to start an Apple store before Apple did. So what would be the attributes they'd be focusing on? Well, from the top, they would probably want to mimic the Apple experience that's been expressed as a brand and through their products and software and services. So it would be articulated, you know, the essence would be, if only buying devices didn't suck so much. So they'd be leveraging that Apple experience. In terms of personality, from a customer perspective, they want to be focusing on helpful. But from their business perspective, they probably want to be casual so that they can set up that situation and that mood or that relationship where they can be really helpful. In terms of emotional benefits from the, uh, their customer perspective, it would be focusing on trusting, doing those things that create and, and reinforce this notion of trust so that they come back uh, on a regular basis. But internally, 
but they want to make sure that they're doing from a staffing perspective and the delivery perspective is they're making sure that the customers feel cared for. And of course, you know, they're trying to be confident in the way they're caring for and creating trust, but that's a secondary thing. In terms of rational benefits, they want to make sure that they're providing expert advice during the purchase experience. And then when those customers come back and there's an issue and, you know, there's no technology that's perfect in spite of Apple's best attempts, there will be IT support required. So if I'm the owner and the manager of this store, I know that we have to be on top of IT support for it. And then at the most functional level, we have to have a great selection of Apple products uh, to be sold so that when somebody has a need, you know, they've got to replace their phone or their computer, what, might, what have you, we've got those products in stock. In stock. Secondly, that we have the expertise and the knowledge to help to provide the guidance so they're making the best choices for them and according to their budget, whatever it might be. Now, from my perspective, if I'm the owner manager, I wanna make sure that I've got hardware services so that if they wanna to put together a whole package, they need a computer, a printer, you know, some other accessories, that type of thing, we can take care of the whole thing. And if there's any setup, synchronization, all of that, those types of requirements, that can be handled too. All right? So um, let's visit another example. So just for the sake of brainstorming, let's imagine that I'm a real estate agent. And my vision might be, I've been thinking differently here, okay? So my vision is the dream home effortlessly bought. That's the vision that I would love to be able to deliver on at some point in my career as a real estate agent. I don't know how we would achieve it right now. I doubt that it is achievable, but I think that's a wonderful vision to have. So based on that vision, I might articulate it and be able to execute it right now based on this promise, personal home matchmakers. And maybe I have a partner uh, the way I practice my uh, real estate brokerage. So we both embrace this differentiating promise that we've established here, personal home matchmakers. We might express it this way though. We might say high tech, high tech home matchmakers. And we might be targeting you know, a younger audience, millennials, Gen Xers who are really into you know, this hybrid of technology, but also personal attention. But of course, bringing in the matchmaking aspect of it too. So the supporting benefit claims then might be data-driven home matchmaking. And the proof point might be that I and my partner provide a personal assessment that's delivered through an app that you know, we can both monitor and adjust or let it evolve as they look at more potential properties and we get to know each other a little bit better. So it's a learning experience, but it's also helping move them down the funnel of uh, eventually purchasing a home or selling one if that's the situation. The second might be, um, for the sake of discussion, smart drone tours. So maybe uh, you or you have uh, somebody you know is an expert at uh, delivering drone tours and they're so good at it, they can do a tour of an entire house at eye level and then they can zoom up above the backyard, go over the house, cover the whole neighborhood, then you know, get a view of how close the, the closest school is, some of the shopping, some of the other attributes of the community and so on. So I, that'd be kind of a cool thing to do. And then maybe the final thing is uh, you add in there five star negotiating ranking. Um, so we all know that you know, an awful lot of this falls on the negotiating skills of the, uh, the broker or agent that we're working with. So in this instance, 
maybe there's client-based negotiating rankings and me and my partner happen to have had, get a score of 4.6 out of five possible stars. So these are just ideas to um, get you started. Or here's another example. Let's say I'm in the pet, pet management product business. So I'm a manufacturer. It's not a service business. So my long-term vision is automated pet care. I don't know if this is possible or not. I don't even know if it's a good idea, but just brainstorming here, okay? So let's say that the promise right now, what you can deliver is low care, pet care, and control. The hook might be when you can't be, um, you know, for when you can't be there, but you still care. So the benefit claims and supporting points might be, let's say you make dog collars and harnesses that have low tech magnetics. So these collars enable automatic activations of things like doggy doors, feeders, water, you know, whatever might be associated with making your pet comfortable and happy during the day. But because they're magnetic, there are no batteries, that type of thing. So you can riff on that. So I jumped ahead of myself a little here. So because there are no batteries, they'd be low um, and they'd be low in hassle-free maintenance. And like so many products we use these days that have batteries that need to be replaced. And then maybe it, it results in happier pets and it's been tested by some third party and validated that way. So now the pets feel like they have more freedom. So they're effectively being managed. Okay, I think you can see where this is going. So I wanted to back up why some of this uh, thinking is really important. So um, in doing these assignments, you're gonna be wrestling with ideas and inspiration and trying to um, dig deep on these, be brutally honest with yourselves, and then pare it down to the, um, the most relevant and valuable ones, given your needs and wants and your customers' needs and wants. Um, but there's something to keep important in here. If we, <clears throat> the results of a, of a study, now this was done six or seven years ago, but it was conducted by the University of Maryland uh, with some outside um, researchers. And they did a nationwide study um, on SMBs where they were successful competitively and where they were not. So they got a really good handle on where they were being really successful and where there was a lot of room for improvement. So this might be surprising to you, I don't know. It was a little to me, but the, the thing that small businesses across the US were best at was compliance. Okay, this is great for helping us as the owners and managers um, maybe sleep better at night and maybe keep more money in our bank accounts because we aren't paying fines and fees or we don't have legal challenges. Um, but I was shocked that that was the number the top category. Number two, not surprisingly, is customer service. An awful lot of this, we know that our business success is based on the relationships we have with our customers, clients, and patients. So we put, in, we put extra emphasis into that. And then um, beyond, uh, below that uh, are a number of other things like you know, training and developing our workforce. This is our staff, the people we work with, um, integrating in other factors like technology, products, that type of thing. But then there's a big drop off. And it turns out that the area that is most neglected and where there's greatest opportunity is in marketing and innovation. So, so few businesses take, take a, a moment or a breath to think about how they can improve their businesses. And once they've made those improvements, do a better job of communicating that to their audiences. I see it every day, lots of successful businesses, really wonderful owners and operators of them. Their heads are screwed on straight. They have really good intentions, that type of thing. They just don't do a good job of marketing it, communicating it, getting the word out there, 
and getting other people out there to spread the word for them and become their partners. So that's why this exercise is so important. Okay, so we're gonna finish a little early today, um, it looks like, um, but you have a lot of work to do, so maybe you can get started on that. As soon as I finish um, this session, I'm gonna email to you a couple of worksheets that will help you get started and accelerate the execution of, of your latest exercises. So here's a little inspiration. Here's an ad I came across re recently, and it, it was um, amongst a whole bunch of ads I've been looking at from other sources, and this one just stopped me. And I'm not even in the market for concierge medical services, but I thought this was stated so succinctly. Healthcare elevated, concierge medicine, and then the doctor's name is listed here. Now, he didn't have a big graphic, that type of thing, but he did use color, solid color very effectively. And then subliminally, you know, he used um, the cross just as a nice reinforcement, but kept the copy and that type of thing, kind of humble. Um, it's aspirational, but humble at the same time. I thought it was a really nice combo. Um, I came across another ad, and this one really stopped me also and made me chuckle. How to successfully sue your money manager. So if you're in the um, financial services, money management, uh, advisory category, and I've had a few clients in this category in the past, and they've always struggled with how they're gonna promote themselves that also is compliant with an awful lot of the regulations out there. Um, it really, it really um, ties their hands in what they can do. But if you're an attorney, <laughs> you don't have those shackles holding you back. And, um, and uh, an awful lot of attorneys know that there are a lot of people who feel like uh, something wasn't properly managed with the money. So um, I love the boldness and the brashness of this ad. It definitely uh, commands attention. And uh, whoever did it did a great job with the photograph too. Um, I don't know if they spent a lot of money. They didn't have to to get this shot. It's so simple. It could have been shot anywhere with a backdrop. Here was another ad, and I thought this was uh, um, inspirational um, because this is a group of people who are basically real estate professionals, but they've banded together to create this coalition of people who are gonna work together collaboratively for your benefit, you, um, their client. Um, and so they're promoting this in San Francisco. Now I haven't used them, I have no idea how effective they are and what kind of reputation they have, but this ad definitely stopped me and it really made me think that, wow, there's still a new way of approaching um, residential real estate um, brokerage, um, services. And then another one <laughs> that made me laugh uh, was this one from a law firm um, where all of the principal attorneys uh, happened to be women. And I thought they did a great job of commanding attention and differentiating themselves in a very relevant way. So I hope you find that uh, these examples helpful. Um, and uh, I want to remind everybody that I'm going to be doing a live Q&A session again this Thursday at 3 o'clock. Uh, I'll be sending out an invitation with a link to it uh, so it's easy to find for you. Um, and um, I want to encourage those of you who are still working on some of your first round ass assignments to now try to get caught up as quickly as you can and send me what you've got. Uh, I really don't care what it looks like. You can send it in any state. And again, you, all you have to do is take a picture of it with your phone. Some of the folks sent it in to me that way, and that, was, that worked great. And I was able to get back to them pretty quickly. So next week, we'll be focusing in on um, the next stage of taking you into developing a product or service that will elevate your business and take you to this place where you can feel more competitive and uh, in a place where you can be more profitable. 
So your assignment again is to um, complete the updated customer pyramid exercise, do the message platform exercise. You can email me at any time with any questions, um, uh, issues, uh, what have you, at rob at adwater.com. And, uh, and I'll be sending you a follow-up email um, with the invitation for the Q&A session on Thursday. Thank you very much and have a great day.